Good day. My name is Terry Calvani. My colleague Hiram Andrews and I welcome you to this Training on Demand module on merger remedies for use by the International Competition Network. Although now we both practice law at Freshfields Brookhouse Daringer in Washington, D.C., we both have backgrounds in competition law enforcement. I previously worked at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission and later as a law clerk at the U.S. Antitrust Modernization Commission, where we considered changes to the U.S. antitrust laws, including modification to the U.S. merger regime. Terry was commissioner of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission at a time when there was much merger activity and therefore much merger review. Later, Terry was a member of the board of the Irish Competition Authority, where he held the merger review portfolio at one time. Unfortunately, merger remedies often play second fiddle to the substantive law of mergers. The glory or excitement for some lay in those aspects of the investigation where they seek to determine the legality of the underlying deal, the transaction. In other words, whether or not the merger would violate the law. Some think that consideration of remedy is much less sexy. I remember some years ago when I was at the FTC and we had a young summer intern, he approached me and told me that he was very much interested in returning to the commission on a full-time basis, wanted to come work with us, and he wanted to do merger work. I suggested that he talk with the heads of the various merger units, including the unit that oversaw remedies. He readily accepted my suggestion, but added he didn't want to talk to the merger remedies team since that work wouldn't be as exciting or, in his view, as important. I told him that he had dramatically underestimated the importance of the remedies unit. The, the fact of the matter is that the value of a merger challenge is wholly dependent on the remedy. It's sort of like a golf game. The drive off the tee box can be very dramatic, but it can also be irrelevant if the golfer can't sink the putt. We want to give remedies their due today and hope we can interest you in thinking about this very important aspect of merger law. Although it may go without saying, implementation of merger remedies should be undertaken only when there is a competitive problem, and importantly, the remedies must address the competition problem. I wouldn't even mention it if we were not aware of cases where authorities have imposed remedies that had no reasonable relationship to the identified competition issue. The slide on the screen basically <clears throat> describes the commonplace merger scenario confronted by agencies such as yours. When you've got a competition problem with a merger, the authority must ask the following questions. Do we enjoin the merger? Or, alternatively, do we impose remedies? And in the latter event, should the remedies be structural, such as a divestiture? Or should it be behavioral? Or, or, or maybe a mix of the two? Now today, we want to explore these and related issues for the remainder of the program. A few points to start. First, Terry and I understand that you and our audience do not operate on a clean slate. Your laws may have already addressed some of the topics to be discussed today, and some options may be prohibited by domestic law. Second, in this presentation, we will seek to constrain our own biases, or at least identify them, such that they are explicit. Lastly, we will seek to both utilize and identify the ICN knowledge base as we proceed. And speaking of that, a good place to begin is with the ICN Merger Working Party Merger Remedies Review Project Report. Now that's a pretty long title, so going forward we'll refer to it simply as the Remedies Report. This report was published back in 2005, but it still contains a great deal of value. If you haven't read the report, do so. It's really well worth your time. And I should note that the project was chaired by the UK Competition Commission and the Irish Competition Authority. Uh, since 2005, many of you know that both of those agencies have morphed uh, and they have different names. Now, I, I still remember the project well, and I wish I could take credit for it. 
But by that time, I'd passed the merger's portfolio over to my colleague Ted Henneberry and gone off to fight cartels. The remedies report addressed the general rationale for merger remedies. And the slide on the screen captures the international consensus on this subject. I want to call your attention to the language. Remedies should be applied only to address identified competitive problems expected to arise from a transaction. And merger remedies are not tools of industrial planning and are generally poorly suited to achieve aims wider than the identified competitive effects. In other words, you don't take remedies unless there's a competition problem. And the virtue of remedies is they may cure the anti-competitive problem in a cost-effective way and still permit the transaction to go forward. If there's an anti-competitive problem that can't be cured with a cost-effective remedy, then the transaction should not be permitted or enjoined depending upon the local law. Like the substantive analysis of mergers, remedies also have elements of risk that accompany any prediction of the future. It's worth stressing that pre-merger analysis necessarily involves a bit of crystal ball gazing, or if you prefer, reading chicken entrails. As Hiram has just said, merger analysis almost always involves risk associated with predicting the future. The challenge is how you're going to deal with that risk. An effective remedial approach recognizes these elements of risks and seeks to minimize them in a cost-effective manner. And just to be clear, this module focuses on the issues that arise once a likely competition problem has been identified. It does not focus on the substantive tests employed in making that determination. We recognize that remedies are in part a function of the National Merger Review Design. As Terry indicated a few minutes ago, some jurisdictions employ a regulatory model where mergers subject to pre-merger notification must obtain government clearance. Others employ a law enforcement model where the government will seek to enjoin a merger that would violate national law. While the model can influence remedial issues, the choice of model is beyond the scope of this module. Let's focus on timing for a moment. I recall a time when merger remedies were considered after a determination on the merits of the merger had been made. It was the caboose at the very end of the train. Today, best practices underscore that it is important to begin consideration of possible remedies early in the evaluation of a merger, at least at that point when it appears likely that the transaction presents significant competition issues. This permits timely conversations with the parties that might negate the need for an unnecessary and prolonged investigation. And importantly, where the same transaction is being evaluated by other competition authorities, it's necessary to begin conversations with those other agencies early in order to minimize inconsistent remedial outcomes. We realize that your ability to do this may be constrained by local law, but it's still really an important point. But we're not going to discuss confidentiality restrictions and waivers in this particular model, but they are both really important. If confidentiality restrictions inhibit discussion with other agencies in your jurisdiction, but waivers would solve that problem, you should certainly think about securing waivers if they're not already part of your toolkit. Okay, let's get started. Assume a proposed transaction is reasonably likely to present non-trivial anti-competitive injury. The first question is whether there are remedies, short of prohibiting the merger, that will cure the competition problem and still permit the transaction to go forward. The slide from the remedies report captures the gist of the exercise. Do we block the deal or permit it to go forward with conditions? Can we fashion a remedy that will permit the transaction to go forward and still cure the problem in an efficient and cost-effective way? Note that you really can't answer that question without first considering whether remedies, short of blocking the deal, are going to work. So let's now consider these issues. 
The Remedies Report lays out two valuable templates. One addresses the effectiveness of any contemplated remedy. Is the remedy comprehensive? Which is to say, does it remedy all of the competition problems expected to flow from the deal? Then, is the risk acceptable? Now, unfortunately, there is no software program of which I'm aware that will measure this for you. This issue has got to be examined in the context of the facts of each transaction. Experience and good judgment are particularly valuable assets here. And third, is the remedy practical? Can you really implement, monitor, and enforce it? And lastly, does the remedy solve the problem throughout the period of otherwise expected injury? The second template prompts us to always consider the potential costs associated with the contemplated remedy. Simply put, the remedy impact costs are the distortions or inefficiencies in market outcomes created by the remedy itself. For example, price caps may discourage market entry by creating doubt as to the ability to recoup one's investment. Remedy operating costs are those associated with implementing, monitoring, and enforcing the remedy. For example, agency resources expended monitoring compliance is just such a cost. Lastly, the remedy may impede the realization of efficiencies or other benefits that would have otherwise accrued. And <laughs>
by that. Unless there's...
discouraged. <laughs> including <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
entry by...